All right, good morning, everyone. I uh, know we're a little bit behind schedule. I'll try to get us back on track. Um, because you know, essentially, I don't have much to say here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the title of this talk that I want to give right now is Do Big Data and AI Solve the Economic Calculation Problem? And this, well, I have uh, Dr. Lambert, he was my co author on this paper. Um, of course, it's me here presenting it, but I feel like he needs a shout out because he did most of the work. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you have me uh, presenting. If you have any questions, ask him. So the uh, impetus for this paper was a, a special issue of the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization. They had this uh, special issue with the title, uh, Machine Versus Market, Economic Calculation and Business Organization in the Age of Modern Computing. And the question of the special issue was, will modern computing techniques pose a fundamental transformation of economic organization. And uh, basically, what we had to say was, you know, if you read and understood Mises, you wouldn't even be a asking this question. Uh, uh, so basically, the point of paper is like, here's what Mises said. Um, modern technology hasn't changed that, so uh, no. Uh, so, so that is why I say this will be short, and uh, we can get to lunch a little early, maybe. Um, and, but I will you know, summarize the argument. It will retread a lot of ground that uh, Dr. Salerno talked about in his lecture on uh, uh, economic calculation and socialism. But, and then uh, in light of big data and AI. So here's our paper. It does exist. Uh, it's published within the last year, so feel free to read it. Okay. So this problem of economic calculation. So just define what is economic calculation. The calculation part is simply arithmetic. You can you have numbers, you add and subtract them, that's calculation. The uh, economic part or the economizing part is you have scarce means, uh, you want to allocate them to your most highly valued uses. You don't want to um, allocate them to uh, less valued uses. You don't want to forsake those uh, higher valued uses. That is economizing. So like uh, our first day lectures talking about subjective value, we learned that uh, value is ordinal rankings. You prefer this to that. You can't do arithmetic operations on this. It's just uh, you can't say with my first uh, sack of grain that I like that five times as much as that fifth sack or anything like that. It's just more to less. Uh, it's ordinal. It's not cardinal. You can't do uh, arithmetic operations on it. We also have producer goods. So as uh, Dr. Solero mentioned, you can, you can make production functions. You can say this producer good um, requires, so if we have this uh, producer good H, we'll call it H. Uh, we have various f um, combinations of productive factors we could use to produce H. Maybe uh, four units of A and two units of B, or three units of A and six units of C, or five units of A and three units of F. Um, but, I mean, this is just a, a technological relationship. It's not an economic one. Um, we want to know the opportunity costs of A and B and C and F in order to determine what um, combination of factors to use to uh, satisfy our most highly ranked ends. And what the opportunity costs of those factors? What are, what are we giving up by choosing one of these combinations compared to others? Uh, so the problem is, I mean, before we get to the calculation part, is we need some way to arithmetically compare means and ends to mentally ascertain whether we're using resources in an economizing way. Um, if all we have are like these, if we know all these physical resources we can use to produce things, and we uh, produce these things, we don't know what we're giving. We don't have this common unit in which to compare our yield with uh, our means. So again, starting with just ordinal values, we can't, just based on those alone, we can't calculate. We need uh, a cardinal unit. There's no uh, cardinal unit naturally available to determine the effectiveness of action. And by effectiveness, I mean, are we allocating resources to more highly valued uses? So how do we move from ordinal subjective valuations to uh, precise calculation of profit and loss? We need the market economy or uh, the social appraisement process. 
as Dr. Salerno mentioned. So this social appraisement process, producers uh, value producer goods according to uh, anticipated consumer valuation. So if you recall from Dr. Klein's lecture, entrepreneurs uh, anticipate future consumer prices and their willingness to bid on various factors of production is based on what they expect uh, the, the discounted marginal revenue product of those factors to be in certain lines of production. Uh, and they need uh, prices in order to understand that uh, current consumer prices, they're a help in anticipating future prices, but you can't just take current prices and know what future prices will be. There has to be that entrepreneurial appraisement of the future. And so since consumer goods are exchanged for money, consumers demonstrate they value a consumer good more than the money they give up for it, and entrepreneurs are creating this price structure for the higher order goods when they're bidding for uh, factors of production in anticipation of uh, the future prices of goods that they will create at the end of the production process. This creates this monetary structure that has a commensurate money unit or uh, monetary price for both consumer goods and producer goods, uh, making calculation possible. So entrepreneurs, say after, I mean, there's both this backward-looking process and forward-looking process, where after they've engaged in a productive process, they can ascertain whether they've made profit or loss. Uh, they you know, paid certain prices for producer goods, they created consumer goods, they sold those, they can engage in this uh, cost accounting. Um, and as they're, uh, and there's always also this forward-looking aspect, so backwards, forward, I'm sure. Say this is backwards, this is forwards. Uh, they are able to anticipate they, they anticipate future prices, <coughs> bid on, as I mentioned, the uh, current factors. So factor prices have baked into them these anticipation of future prices. So th that's the forward-looking aspect. Of course, entrepreneurs might make errors. They make losses. And I mean, some socialists will criticize, like, oh, look at this you know, economic calculation. You think it's so important. It's not perfect. It's, well, Kind of like, uh, this is the point. We can tell that there's loss, right? That's not a failure of the system. That's the system working, right? Because in, under socialism, you don't know uh, whether you're making a uh, profit or loss. You don't know whether you're allocating resources to more highly valued uses. And I think um, Dr. Salerno says it well. He's worth quoting, uh, I mean, not too lengthy here, but uh, this is from the epilogue of... Uh, the Mises Institute edition of the 1920 article, uh, Economic Calculation, the Socialist Commonwealth. Uh, he says, there thus comes into being the market's monetary price structure, a genuinely social phenomenon. And I like that, that social part. That it's really ironic about socialism is that uh, in the market economy, every market participant has an input, uh, can affect this, uh, is involved in this, genuinely social phenomenon. Under socialism, it's just the central planner. So it's uh, not very social in that, 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 to that extent. So they create this genuinely, uh, or at least this genuinely social phenomenon, which every unit of exchangeable goods and services is assigned a socially significant cardinal number. So that, that's also important, that it has social significance. This, some of the uh, cyber communists, uh, I mean, that's not a pejorative term. That's like what they're actually called. Uh, they, uh, um, in their proposals of how, how do we overcome this problem that Mises pointed out. Uh, I mean, they try to come up with some kind of cardinal numbers, but they're not socially meaningful. They're often just arbitrary, and we'll, I'll talk about some of those. Um, so you get this socially significant cardinal number, which has its roots in the minds of every single member of society yet must forever transcend the contribution of the individual human mind. So that's this social appraisement process where you create this unified price structure, incorporates consumer valuations of consumer goods and um, entrepreneurs' anticipations of future prices and how the, they, uh, affecting how they bid on um, producer goods. So you have this meaningful way to compare inputs and outputs uh, in monetary terms and w within a meaningful cardinal unit. And since I'm, well, Quoting, I have a, a big Mises quote. I, I won't apologize, though. I think Mises is worth, uh, always worth quoting at length. 
I, what did I notice in, so it was really nice with this special issue. I uh, had the opportunity, the, the editors of it, organize kind of a paper workshop where contributors could, uh, you know, get early views on uh, drafts of people's papers and trash them. And uh, wh what I found, like, communicating with the, the cyber commies is that there's this uh, disc, they don't, they don't really incorporate value theory. And as Dr. Salerno mentioned, this has been a problem for a long time. Like, uh, even among the classical school economists, they weren't able to effectively respond to the socialists because of um, their flawed value theory. So what Mises says here is that all attempts at disproving the conclusiveness of my thesis, and I love reading Mises when he's talking about his 1920 paper. Sometimes he does it in the third person. It's like this irrefutable smash of uh, the intellectual case for socialism. So I mean, the conclusiveness of my thesis were destined for failure because they did not penetrate the value theory at the core of the problem. All of these books, theses, and essays tried to rescue socialism. They wanted to show that it was indeed possible to construct a socialist commonwealth in which economic calculations could be performed. They failed to see that one must begin with the question of how in an economy consisting of preferring and deferring, that is, making unequal valuations, one can arrive at comparable valuations in the use of equations. And this goes back to uh, Dr. Jonathan Newman's lecture, how neoclassicals try to do this uh, with indifference. We, they're trying to create equalities, but you can't really do that when you have, remember we start with ordinal preferences. It's inequalities, but they uh, try to smash it into uh, equations rather than inequalities. So it was that they came upon the absurd idea of recommending the equations of mathematical catalactics, which depict an image devoid of human action as a substitute for the monetary calculation of the market economy. And they continue to do so. So uh, in addition to this problem of not, I mean, you've got to really start with value theory in understanding this uh, calculation problem. Another issue, and a related issue, with the uh, socialists, the cyber communists, is this confusion of an economic problem versus a technological problem. So if I, I mean, you might see this even in a lot of uh, economics textbooks where you have an objective function and say you're trying to maximize something subject to these constraints. Well, this isn't an economic problem, this is an engineering problem, right? So, if the socialist, the, the planner, um, specifies certain ends and wants to achieve this end, like maybe minimize the uh, resources used to achieve this end. Now this is not dealing with economizing because it's not considering the alternative uses of those resources. It's just a technological or engineering problem. So to excuse me, quote Mises again, it says, technology operates with countable and measurable quantities of external things and effects. It knows causal relations between them, but it is foreign to their relevance to human wants and desires. Its field is that of objective use value only. That is, creating physical goods. We, we know that. That's a technological thing, that um, knowing uh, technical rates of substitution, what physical goods you can create with what physical inputs. But it's not uh, relevant to... Uh, human wants and desires, to value. So I've got to say a simple uh, example to illustrate this difference. So suppose a central planner is magically endowed with knowledge of all quantitative causal relations, so knows all, these, uh, knows all the technology involving resources under his control and only cares about his own well-being. So even setting aside uh, the issue of producing for everyone, he just wants to satisfy his own ends. So uh, let's say one of his ends, he wants to build a bridge to nowhere, as uh, government actors like to do. So he wants to build this bridge, and uh, uh, he has to choose among various resources available to him to decide what, what resources to use to build this bridge. Right? So the question is, how does he select that combination of producer goods that yields the bridge most economically with respect to uh, alternative uses of those inputs. So here's a very simplified example uh, where you can choose between a platinum bridge or a stone bridge. And uh, all it takes is for to build this platinum bridge, A number of units in uh, kilograms of platinum, some B units of labor, and some C units of land area. And I was, I was thinking about this. I was, 
uh, reminded of that Monty Python and the Holy Grail with the anarcho-syndicalists where they're just playing in the mud. Oh, we just need land and labor and we, uh, that's our production process. Um, the uh, production process for the stone bridge is very similar. Um, as you can see, it also requires B units of labor and C units of land to make this uh, very simple. Uh, the only difference in inputs is D units uh, of stone. So here, I, well, how does the planner choose between these? How, how can we compare A plus B plus C, each of which are in different units? We've got a weight, lengths of time, uh, land area, uh, with P, P being the bridge, the finished bridge, or the other production process, where it uses D units of stone and the same amount of labor and land with S. Or can we compare A with D? That is, can we compare uh, kilograms of platinum with kilograms of stone? I mean, maybe if we want to have a, a lighter bridge, I don't but that's uh, not economically relevant. So if we try to do something like that, so claiming P minus A, if we sub I mean, it's nonsense. We have one bridge and we subtract A kilograms of uh, platinum. We say, oh, that's less costly or less whatever than uh, one unit of a stone bridge minus D units of stone. And therefore, the stone bridge could be constructed instead of the platinum bridge. It's not, it's not meaningful. We're, not using incom we're using incommensurate units. So there's really uh, no way that this planner, even producing for his own consumption, of this bridge to nowhere, uh, there's no calculation that's possible. Where, unlike if we did have a market for platinum bridges and uh, for labor and land, there could be cardinal numbers. Instead of a P, you know, a P would represent you know, a monetary price, and so would A and S. So, so we'd have this commensurate unit in money prices in which we could meaningfully calculate profit and loss and whether uh, it's more economically effective to, uh, and by that I mean, are we allocating resources from our highly valued uses compared to their opportunity costs uh, between the stone bridge and the platinum bridge? And what I find notable, um, so kind of a similar example in human action, uh, Mises' comment when he goes through a, a thought experiment like this is, uh, again, quoting Mises, it says, today we calculate from the point of view of our present knowledge and of our present anticipation of future conditions. We do not deal with the problem of whether or not the director or planner will be able to anticipate future conditions. What we have in mind is that the director cannot calculate from the point of view of his own present value judgments and his own present anticipation of future conditions, whatever they may be. So it's really, I would say, damning here to the socialist case because he's like, let's set aside condition, or anticipations of future conditions. Just looking at what stone and platinum we have now, I mean, the, the planner is not even thinking about uh, maintaining his capital stock. Not that the capital stock would be meaningful, but capital goods. Um, it's it, it, it's a really intractable problem. Even not even considering the uh, greater complexities of having to plan for the future. Um, even in this simp very simplistic case, the planner is unable to engage in calculation. So uh, thinking of the market economy, there's this difference in kind between a monetary economy and a non-monetary economy. Uh, value calculation, that is, it, it's impossible in a society without money. Uh, you need that, mon that commensurate unit. It's really uh, uh, yeah, fundamental to calculation. And um, if you recall from Dr. Rittenauer's lecture on Austrian capital theory, this a uh, category of capital um, only exists in a market economy. I mean, you can have in a socialist economy, or not in, I guess shouldn't call it a socialist uh, society, there's no economizing, right, in a social, under a system of socialism. You can have capital goods, but you don't have capital because you don't have, because capital is that uh, sum of the monetary values of capital goods. You can only have that when there's exchange of capital goods. So this category of capital only exists within a, a market economy. And um, as Dr. Salerno emphasized that, um, there's no economy because capital accounting is uh, impossible under socialism. There's no economy in terms of rationally uh, allocating resources according to their most highly valued uses. Okay, so to just really uh, reiterate this problem facing the central planner, that 
I mean, it's fully possible for the central planner to specify an end and then um, organize the factors of production in order to attain that output, but it's unable to economize on the employment of those higher order goods according to their genuine opportunity costs. So in the words of Mises, the, the central planner will be floundering in the ocean of possible and conceivable economic combinations without the compass of economic calculation. He, he had a lot of metaphors for uh, how, or another one, he says, you know, the central planner would be groping in the dark. And I think this is actually a bit too generous of Mises, because you think, like, if you're groping around in the dark, you might actually find what you're looking for. Um, but the thing about the socialist planner is that it, can't know. He can't find what he's looking for. So um, do all the groping he wants, but it w won't find the, uh, the, the um, sorry, the most uh, economically efficient means. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really seems like Mises is right. He really smashed the case for socialism. Uh, unfortunately, and it's still today, he says, well, of course, some stubborn Marxians raised objections, <laughs> and they still do. Hmm. So that's a, a difficulty in, you know, talking about this, okay, so we now get to this, do big, a, big uh, data and AI change things? And it's like, well, it's hard conceiving, like, how could they? So that, that was a bit of a puzzle, like, okay, what do they, what would it mean for them to solve the calculation problem? Well, I guess for, it's still to be socialism, you'd have to well, get rid of private property in the, uh, means of production, so specifying the institutional prerequisites for economic calculation, one of them being private property in the means of production, free exchange of those goods, and secondly, a common medium of exchange, money. So you have uh, free exchange money prices, I mean, which, yeah, capitalism. Here you have these things, and these are the things you need for economic calculation. So any argument that uh, te technological advances can overcome the calculation problem needs to provide a substitute uh, for the functions that private property and money serve, okay? So it must overcome certain hurdles. Anything else you're doing, it's not, it's a side issue, which some of the socialists do. It's like you're not addressing the calculation problem. It's, it's not occurring. So these hurdles to overcome are these uh, things we get from private property and money. So first, uh, commensurate cardinal units that are meaningful. Uh, for economic decision making, considering the uh, economically efficient employment of scarce resources. And then some mechanism from uh, transforming ordinal rankings to uh, commensurate cardinal numbers. Because right. if all you have is ordinal preferences, you can't uh, do arithmetic operations. You have to have some way of turning them into commensurate cardinal numbers. And thirdly, some capability of forecasting future arrangements of market data, because this, as we'll see, is a big problem with big data. It's all, um, how do you use it to anticipate uh, future market arrangements? Uh, I mean, not only of amounts of current consumer goods, but novel uh, new consumer goods. And how do you know whether those investments are uh, worth pursuing? So this question, uh, can big data overcome these hurdles? Well, no. Uh, like that's the conclusion to come to. Um, so for one thing, uh, the data are entirely that of the past. Uh, it's not clear how you can just take that and magically turn it into a future prices. You still need that entrepreneurial function of appraisement, of uh, anticipating future prices. There's, there's nothing forward-looking about um, data from the past. And and while we acknowledge that, I mean, th these technologies might be useful for entrepreneurs operating in a market economy. Um, say, I mean, they, maybe Amazon, they, I mean, they got all their data, they have uh, you know, these huge inventories, maybe big data, whatever it, big data is, helps them keep up to the minute uh, 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 term or tabs on what they have um, maybe with their inventory records and uh, technology might help us better understand um, technical substitutions, but it doesn't take these and turn them into market prices. So it really doesn't address this problem. As um, Dr. Herbener says, or said a number of years ago, this is still true. 
Uh, you got apples and oranges. No advances in supercomputers can overcome the impossibility of adding them together. They're just incommensurate. So what about AI? Um, the analysis is similar in most ways. Uh, maybe, again, just as you know, big data, past data can be valuable for entrepreneurs, it's imaginable that uh, the use of AI can help entrepreneurs in various ways, but it's not clear. Um, just as Mises said, like, let the central planner have all knowledge of um, ordinal preference rankings, all the resources available to him all the technical rates of substitution and production possibilities. Still can't create a price structure. So it's not clear how AI can, uh, can do that. And I mean, there, there's further issues. Um, so a, a, an editor and contributor to this volume of uh, the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, uh, C. Phelan, he brings up this issue of it, whether AI can create this theory of mind in order to predict human behavior. Um, maybe Dr. Gordon can uh, predict, <laughs> successfully predict, but uh, it's not clear how AI can do it. it. It seems like there needs to be some, yeah, some frame of mind, or a theory of frame of mind. It's also unclear whether AI can break frame and like innovate out of specified parameters, because a lot of the uh, cyber communist models, I mean, they start with pre-specified outputs, but there's no room for them in uh, creating novel goods, um, which, I mean, is an important issue. So, I mean, if you have a stationary economy, maybe it like, be less of a problem, but that's not what socialism promised us, right? We uh, promised me more. Um, so, yeah, again, it doesn't seem like, um, oh, an AI, well, oh, I tried this. So, I, I went, uh, maybe I can't read this. So, I, I told uh, Chad, uh, asked it to centrally plan an economy. And I don't know what I expected. Maybe like it lists all goods and the quantity and prices they should be produced for each day. Um, it'd be a lot of output. Um, but this is what it told me. It's like, oh, well, designing a centrally planned economy, is, you know, it involves central authorities doing these things. It's uh, been attempted, but it has drawbacks and challenges. So here's uh, all the things you have to do. Um, it's a lot of things. I mean, the, least, uh, the list keeps going on. Um, but. Uh, like number two, it says, resource allocation. The central planning authority must determine the allocation of resources among various sectors and industries. This could involve assessing the country's needs and priorities, could, uh, <laughs> and uh, distributing resources accordingly. It's like, okay, how do I do that? Um, so, you know, maybe you can try a different command and it can give you a more useful output, but um, I don't know how to use AI right. I address this question. I found it interesting that, uh, well, Dr. Salerno, in uh, mentioning uh, some socialist responses to Mises, some of the early naive ones, uh, it included using labor time as this commensurate unit or cardinal unit, incommensurate cardinal unit, and they're still doing it. Uh, so a, uh, one of the papers we criticized, one of the more recent, um, well, additions to this literature, uses labor time as a basis for economic calculations? Again, the answer is no, they can't do it. And why not? Well, there's many flaws. The most fundamental one is it doesn't allow you to economize on uh, the produced factors of production. Um, uh, you just can economize on labor. And as far as I can tell from their model, they, I mean, just like the Marxists of old, they um, see capital goods as you know, embodying this labor. So I think they uh, assign uh, the, the hours of labor that it took to produce this capital good, but it's not clear how this is useful in terms of um, considering the opportunity cost of these factors of production. It's like it took this many hours to create it, and I don't think they adjusted for different uh, production processes. So it's just they got a number, but it's not meaningful in terms of determining uh, genuine opportunity costs. Um, so one example of a paper that, or actually this was a book, um, by Cockshot and Cottrell. Cockshot uh, was a contributor to this GBO issue. Um, they start with these planned targets. They use mathematical optimization to meet the targets given constraints. And then, so like they, they acknowledge like, okay, yeah, we, we wanna um, incorporate uh, consumer demands uh, and adjust uh, production based on them. 
So I, I actually really need to reread it because, like, as I understand it now, I'm like, this doesn't. How, how does this work? So because they issue tokens to laborers, like, I think it's like you get this labor hour. To, you work an hour, here's your one token. You work two hours, here's your labor token. And this, how they initially set prices, I'm like, do they do it based on how many hours it took to create this good? So I'm like, how, how can anybody afford anything? Like, say the two of you, <laughs> say, say you and your coworker, you both spent 10 hours, so 20 hours total producing this good, so it costs 20 hours. But you will both get you know, 10 tokens, like neither you can afford it. Like, so I, I don't know how, I, maybe the pricing process is different. So yeah, go check it out yourself uh, if you're uh, interested in such a thing. But after this process of offering these consumer goods and pricing them in some way and seeing, uh, observing consumers spend their tokens, then they're going to adjust future production based on this, uh, any divergence between the assigned price and uh, how many well, consumer demand in terms of these tokens. But uh, however they do this initial pricing process, this procedure has nothing to do with economic calculation. Uh, they do this initial uh, allocation of resources. It pre-specifies what ought to be produced. It doesn't have any necessary relation to uh, what consumers want. But again, this is like described before. This is a technological problem they're doing, not uh, an economic problem. And this this feedback mechanism where they're saying, oh, we have, you know, consumer goods markets. We're going to adjust production based on it. Um, yeah, and they don't consider producing the, the production of alternative goods. It's just, oh, here's our list of goods that we initially produced, and I guess that's what we're going to be consuming through uh, the rest of time. Um, some other cyber communists. Uh, so they acknowledge it. So uh, Philip DePreach, another contributor to this volume, it seems to acknowledge this problem with the labor theory of value. Um, he actually says, oh, yeah, Bumbavirk was right. I'm like, oh, good, we're making progress. Um, but these trial and error methods, go, go read uh, yeah, chapter 26 of Human Action. I mean, Mises talks about to have trial and error, you have to realize you're making errors. Right? Um, and you can't do that without economic calculation. So... Uh, uh, DePreach acknowledges this, but he's like, okay, we're not going to use labor. We're going to use uh, shadow prices. But um, oh, the, the resulting figures say they aren't capturing genuine uh, opportunity costs. They're just arbitrary. Um, another interesting observation made by uh, Nieto and Mateo. Like, they're like, look at Walmart and Amazon. They're big. Why don't we just have them in charge of the... Well, I don't... They don't necessarily like, let's have Amazon just run the economy. But, yeah, they're big but they make use of market prices. They couldn't do what they do without the use of uh, economic calculation. So it's not really uh, it's not, you know, a legit response. You know. So uh, my seems like ending with reading recommendations are popular, so read Mises. <laughs> you get something more out of each time going through human act, just uh, realizing the, the depth of uh, his contribution regarding economic calculation, in addition to other things, of course. Um, don't confuse economic problems with technological wa ones. And uh, I'll end with just a couple more Mises quotes, as Dr. Thorne calls them the quotable Mises. You know. uh, the measurements of physics and chemistry make sense for practical action only because there is economic calculation. It is monetary calculation that made arithmetic a tool in the struggle for a better life provides a mode of using the achievements of laboratory experiments for the most efficacious removal of an uneasiness. So it's like, yeah, it's great you have these technological um, improvements, but it's really economic calculation that allows you to make the best use of them. And the closing quote, so I'm finally done, I'll stop quoting Mises, uh, <laughs> at least for now, um, which I like this quote. It says, our civilization is inseparably linked with our methods of economic calculation. It would perish if we were to abandon the most, this most precious intellectual tool of acting. Uh, yeah, so, well, these are not recommend, reading recommendations, but I uh, figure I should list uh, my references of the work cited. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>